All right, so name of this reading is uh, SWAPS. This is a summary of learning outcomes that we have to go through. So we first have to understand what is a simple plain vanilla interest rate swap. Then we'll have to understand how this is used to convert an asset or liability into each other. Then we have to look at the role of intermediaries, the concept of confirmation in swap. Then there's a concept called comparative advantage argument. This will take us a lot of time from the computation perspective. How discount rates are computed. Then valuation of a swap using the bond positions. Valuation of a swap using the equivalence to FRA. Then we will have to understand currency swap. And then how to use currency swap to transform asset and liability. Valuation of a currency swap using bond position. Valuation of a currency swap using FRS. Credit risk exposure in swap. And then different types of swap would be last learning outcome. Okay, so it's relatively long reading plus uh, computationally intensive. Let's start with the first learning outcome. Give heading in your notes. Mechanics of mechanics of plain vanilla plain vanilla interest rate swap mechanics of plain vanilla interest rate swap there are two parties the first party we are going to call as a pair party the second party would be a now in the swap world when you say pair and receiver you are always talking in the context of fixed rate okay so this is a fixed rate pair and the other party is a fixed rate receiver now both of these parties enter into an agreement with each other. What is an agreement? That for next three years, every year, every year, one party will pay to the other party a fixed rate of 8% and in turn it will receive a floating rate of LIBOR plus 3%. And on what amount are you going to pay interest? We will have a notional amount of let us say 1 million. Now this 1 million is considered or is called as the notional amount. The reason why we call this as notional that this amount will not be exchanged by one party with another. That means at the inception of this transaction, this payer is not going to pay anything to the receiver or vice versa. So it is just a notional amount written into the agreement. This three year is called as the maturity of the swap. Every year is called as the reset frequency or payment frequency. So in our case that payment frequency is on an annual basis and this 8% is called as the price of this swap. So the swap has been priced at 8% which is essentially the fixed rate and this is the floating rate. Are we fine? Now what would be the cash flows? Let us say that LIBOR, so I am making a LIBOR schedule here. LIBOR, this is time 0, time 1, time 2, time 3. LIBOR is a floating rate which will keep on changing. So at time 0, LIBOR was 6%. At time 1, LIBOR was 8%. At time 2, LIBOR was 3%. Just a hypothetical scenario. Time 3, LIBOR was 10%. Now we have a sufficient data to calculate cash flows of this particular swap. So what is the cash flow at time 0? Okay, I am writing that here. Cash flow at time 0 is simply 0. At time 0 these two parties will sign the agreement but no other transaction will happen. They will just sign the agreement. What will happen at time 1? At time 1 Let's call this gentleman as A for ease of reference. Let's this gentleman is A and this gentleman is B. Sorry for this. This gentleman is B. So at time one, A will pay. A will pay how much? Eight percent of one million. That means A will pay how much? Eighty thousand. Whereas A will receive. A will receive what? A will receive LIBOR. A will receive LIBOR. Now the question is when you want to decide what are the cash flows at time 1, what are the cash flows at time 1, the trick to remember is 
द अप्रोप्रिएट रेट इज अ रेट दैट एग्जिस्टेड इन दिस पीरियड नॉट द रेट दैट विल एग्जिस्ट इन दिस पीरियड सो द लाइब ऑर दैट एग्जिस्टेड एट टाइम जीरो इज द रेट दैट विल एग्जिस्ट फ्रॉम टाइम जीरो टू टाइम वन एंड देर फोर वी ऑलवेज यूज वन पीरियड अर्लियर डेट वन पीरियड अर्लियर रेट सो इन दिस केस ए विल रिसीव सिक्स प्लस थ्री ही विल रिसीव नाइंटी थाउजेंड विच मीन्स इसेंशियली देर वुड बी अ नेटिंग एंड नेटिंग वुड बी ए विल रिसीव टेन थाउजेंड राइट सो इन द फर्स्ट ईयर ए इज बेनिफिटिंग आउट ऑफ दिस ट्रांजेक्शन अभी क्लियर सेकेंड ईयर सो टाइम टू टाइम टू ए विल पे हाउ मच दिस विल नॉट चेंज ए विल स्टिल पे एटी थाउजेंड ए विल रिसीव हाउ मच सो नाउ इफ यू आर डूइंग दिस सेटलमेंट एट टाइम टू then the rate that we use is of time 1 so 8 plus 3 he will receive how much 110 that means net a will receive 30000 and finally at time 3 a will pay again 80 but a will receive how much 3 plus 3 60 So at time three net effect, A will pay how much? Twenty thousand. Right. This transaction is called as a plain vanilla swap. Will there be any other transaction at time three? Any other exchange of cash flow? Notional amount? No, because it was not exchanged at time zero. So you don't have to do anything about the notional amount at time three. So the only cash flows that we will have out of this transaction is the netted interest payment. depending on behavior of the exchange rate now if you are a payer in this swap do you expect interest rate to increase or decrease do you expect interest rate to increase or decrease your expectation is that interest rate should increase that way you will benefit out of the transaction and if you are a receiver you will expect interest rate to decrease is that fine you can write down the structure now are we done plain vanilla interest rate swap exchanges floating rate payment for fixed rate payment over the life of the swap floating rate payment at time t in a plain vanilla interest rate swap are computed using floating rate at time t minus 1 that means if you're making if you're doing settlement at time t then the rate that we use is of time t minus 1 we always use one period earlier rate Yes, no. If you're making settlement at time three, then you will use the LIBOR that existed at time two. If you're making settlement at time six, you would use LIBOR that existed at time five. We always use one period earlier rate. And what is the intuition for this? Let's say the settlement is happening in fifth year. So, if you were doing settlement, that settlement is happening because of the money which was lent. or invested in this period and the rate that you would earn on this money would be the rate that existed at time 4 not the rate that existed at time 5 this rate of time 5 would be used for settlement at time 6 are we fine here next learning outcome how plain vanilla interest rate swap can be used the important word here is <laughs> to transform an asset or a liability and calculate the resulting cash flows okay now let us say there are two parties so in fact in this case i will build the entire structure of swap let us say this is party a this is party a this is the bank of party a A went to the bank, and it has taken a loan. The amount of loan is one million, and this loan is given to the given to A at LIBOR plus two percent. That means A has taken a floating rate loan. Now this is party B here. Okay, party B, and this is party B's bank. now party b has taken again a loan of 1 million 
it has taken that at the rate of let us say 9%. Okay. Now imagine why did party A take a loan at floating rate? Maybe because originally the thinking process of party A was they are thinking that party A is thinking that interest rate will go down. Whereas why did party B take a fixed rate loan? Because maybe party B is thinking that interest rate will go up. That is the original thought process. Let us say they have taken loan for a period of four years. Now after one year of the inception, their opinion about this interest rate changed. So today what A thinks is that for the remaining three years rate will increase the other way around and what B thinks is that for the remaining years rates are going to decrease. So to work on their expectation they can transform their liabilities they can transform their liabilities by simply entering into by simply entering into a swap transaction. So how will that swap be structured? Every year party A will pay to B a fixed rate of 9% and party B will pay to A a fixed rate of LIBOR plus 2%. Now see what's happening from party A perspective. Party A, so let me draw this here as well, LIBOR plus 2%, this would be 9%. So party A, it has to pay LIBOR plus 2 to the bank. From where would it get that LIBOR plus 2? It will receive through swap transaction. So you receive L plus 2, you give to the bank, bank liability is taken care of. And how much you pay every year? 9. So what party A did, party A converted a floating rate loan into a fixed rate and think from party B perspective it has to pay 9% to the bank from where would it get that through the swap transaction so every year party B has to pay what LIBOR plus 2 so party B converted a fixed rate loan to a floating rate loan this is the true nature of a swap transaction or a true purpose of a swap transaction now in a real world scenario, it's it's a OTC contract over the counter. It is not that party A and B would be knowing each other. Party A and B would not know each other. So they would take help of a they will take help of a dealer. It is a dealer who would help them facilitate this deal. So it is the dealer who is actually going to be the counterparty on both the sides. And when dealer will enter into a trade, when he receives 9% here, he will not pass on 9%. To this party, it will pay, instead of 9, it will pay 8.9%. And when it receives LIBOR plus 2, it will not pay LIBOR plus 2. It will pay maybe LIBOR plus 1.9%. And in this process, dealer will make profit on both the sides. But in turn, dealer has exposed himself to credit risk, the counterparty risk that what if either A or B default, then of course, it is the dealer who would have to make those losses good. Is that fine? You can write down now.